All right. How's the how's the in person going? How's the the in person? You know, it's a little bit surreal. I think for for a lot of us, you know, it's like <laughs> wow, three D people. <laughs> yeah. Am I allowed to be doing this? <laughs> it's like we we've all been living the allegory of the cave for the last two years. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's nice. I think it's uh, I think we've all enjoyed to actually kind of break bread and cookies and, and other things together. Uh, <laughs> Forget com comfort others. snacks. Yeah, exactly. Have com have uh, coffee with other scientists and talk about science. It's actually something without a Zoom. It's uh, pretty awesome. nice. So yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. We've made it. We're at the end here. A um, couple more talks. Uh, and, and we always save the best for last, I should say, hopefully. Um, uh, today... <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, Michael Burchick here um, joining us from Australia, and unfortunately, he probably would have been here, except that uh, Australians are not even allowed to leave their own country at all, period, full stop. Hopefully, that's going to change soon, and when we do the second year of this uh, conference next year, we'll, uh, as we have with other people, oh, you're shaking your head. Well, we're we already going to volunteer to you to do this. <laughs> we'll have uh, some people uh, here in person more and more. So um, Michael Burchick is um, University of Sy at uh, University of Sydney Q Control. Both, um, uh, my, he's the CEO and founder of Q Control, which is a quantum technology company, uh, and professor of quantum physics and quantum technology at the University of Sydney. Um, in his academic position, he leads a research team as a Chief Investigator in the ARC, ARC Center of Excellence for Engineered Quantum Systems, exploring the role of control engineering in quantum coherent systems. Michael earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's and PhD from Harvard University. He held a research fellowship in the ion storage group at NIST Boulder and has served as a full-time technical consultant to DARPA, helping to steer government investments in quantum information and advanced computer architectures. Uh, Michael is an SXSW South by Southwest and TEDx speaking alumnus and a multi-time Australian Museum Eureka Prize nominee and winner. Um, and he's also uh, a, a partner with us uh, at Zapata, um, and we'll be doing a joint demonstration uh, with his company uh, later on at a conference uh, this year. Uh, and I can share, since Len uh, uh, did introduce me and say he's also a, he's also a BJJ practitioner. So we have a, a, in this uh, quantum sphere, for some reason, some martial artists who uh, double as, double as uh, quantum CEOs. So with that, I yield to Michael. Great. Thank you for the kind introduction. I just want to confirm that you can still hear me all right. Uh, give me a thumbs up, Chris. You're good. Excellent. Well, thank you all uh, for, for joining. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Christopher and Vanita and all the organizers at URI for the opportunity to speak here. Of course, I'd like to thank also the other speakers. And I wanted also to congr congratulate URI on the launch of its master's degree program and its new efforts in quantum information science. It's really fantastic to see so much investment around the world uh, in this area, and it's uh, it's particularly important in my view that we have uh, greater emphasis on on university basic research programs in the field. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm both from the University of Sydney and Q Control. Although today the work I'll be presenting is uh, primarily work conducted by the team at Q Control, and I'll focus on. Uh, our efforts using control to improve and automate quantum computers, and in particular, deploying AI and machine learning for this pro uh, problem. Um, I'm gonna start off by acknowledging some of the people who've been involved in this work, because uh, if, I, if I don't do it now, I'll forget. Um, first, at, uh, at the University of Sydney, I'd like to acknowledge really the exceptional efforts of uh, Robert Wolf and Ting Ray Tan, who, who run the academic laboratory every day. It's a trapped ion quantum computing laboratory and have done quite a magnificent job through the last couple of years uh, uh, with our COVID restrictions. And then at Q-Control, I wanted to recognize uh, the leadership uh, from Andre Carvalho and Michael Hush, who have uh, overseen a lot of the technical programs that, uh, that have led to the results that I'll talk about today. In this talk, I'm going to focus on some of the real key bottlenecks that we see in taking systems from the integrated circuit level that Will uh, alluded to in his talk. You're gonna see a lot of uh, uh, shared analogies in, in this talk uh, through to today's modern 
uh, processor equivalents, right? There are so many things that need to happen. And in Will's talk, there was a great emphasis on the hardware engineering that needs to be undertaken. In this talk, I'm going to focus on what it takes to operate those devices at scale. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the problems of hardware error and the manual nature of the way we tend to operate these devices. So I'll start with a bit of motivation, uh, talking about something we call quantum firmware, which is the, the, the natural home, if you will, of AI-based hardware automation and optimization. Uh, and then I'll tell you about a series of experiments using quantum control and AI in particular, in order to improve the, uh, the error rates, the error performance of real quantum computing systems. Uh, I'll talk about some work at IBM on improved hardware resilience against instability and drift. I'll talk about automation using AI agents to automate the tune-up processes that bring our systems online. And then at the end, I'll share some recent results on using reinforcement learning, so learning control, in order to autonomously design universal gate sets. Just to, at the start, uh, again, to refresh an analogy that was made before, I think it's, it's really useful to look at uh, the history of technology development to gain insights into how we can you know, achieve what we're, what we're all setting out to achieve. The first uh, analogy that I really like is the Wright brothers. Now it's of course a familiar uh, uh, image of the Wright flyer at Kitty Hawk. What I think is a little bit less appreciated is what was so profound about this. Uh, they were not the first to fly. Um, they were the first to achieve um, manned or crewed powered controlled flight. They actually entered quite a crowded field. They were newcomers to the field of aviation or what today we would call it aviation. There were many teams building aircraft. There were actually many teams that had built aircraft that got off the ground, but they achieved what others could not by introducing what today we would call control theoretic concepts. In fact, their key innovations were one, giving the pilot command over the machine instead of trying to achieve something called inherent stability, and two, introducing deformable airfoils under command of the pilot. They introduced control theory and were able to achieve what others could not. And Q-Control's efforts are focused in a similar way on enabling the quantum technology industry by a focus on quantum control. Now to return to a theme that uh, has emerged several times throughout these, uh, these talks and in particular in Wills, uh, it's useful to remember that quantum systems are extremely prone to error. Now you can get that from this uh, artist rendering of decoherence. Just try and stare and focus on this image. It's an exceptionally difficult thing to do. Whenever we encode information into a quantum device, that device tends to suffer from degradation. Uh, we heard about uh, the big D from, from Will's talk of decoherence, but there are many sources of error in quantum computers. And uh, going back to a question that was asked a little while ago, uh, the scale of this is really quite profound. I will, will cast it one way, I'll cast it another, um, that in a conventional computer, the transistors in your system can run for about a billion years at a billion operations per second and never suffer a hardware fault, never have a, a bit flip error. In an, a quantum computer, the approximately equivalent number, and this is a bit of a community average, so nobody should be uh, uh, too offended if it's a little different from what they achieve personally, but that community average is about one one thousandth of a second. And this is where that 20 plus orders of magnitude difference comes in. This is really a staggering uh, scale of how susceptible these systems are to error compared with the computing technology with which we are perhaps more familiar. And it does actually directly impact what we can do today. So again, coming back to a question that was asked, here's an example where we uh, uh, want to execute a quantum algorithm on a near-term device. This uh, particular problem is a vehicle routing problem using uh, optimization. We take that problem, we map it to a quantum circuit, and then we execute that quantum circuit, which is reasonably small. It involves five or seven uh, qubits. Uh, we map that to execution on a quantum computer, in particular, a device from IBM. Now, when we use the, you know, the out-of-the-box uh, vehicle routing program uh, problem uh, tutorial that exists in IBM's framework called Qiskit, this, this problem actually runs with a 99% failure probability. That's right, failure probability, that it is so much more likely to give the wrong answer or not give an answer that has any physical relevance at all than it is to give the right answer. 
So we really see that the hardware errors are our bottleneck in what we can execute today and will be going into the future. Now, even though this is such a challenge, we're not actually uh, uh, as bad off as it might seem. And that's because there are more lessons to learn from other areas of technology. The, the instability of quantum computing hardware is not a unique problem in, in technology. My, one of my favorite examples comes from uh, the Northeast local Boston Dynamics who build these amazing walking robots. Now, again, the, the efforts from Boston Dynamics are a tour de force in the application of control theory to stabilizing a dynamically unstable system. But there's one more element. And that one additional element is that that stabilization is autonomous. There is not just a, uh, a person who's always coming and writing the robots or, or applying, you know, pressing the button to, to restabilize the robot when it starts to fall over. This is done in an automatic way using some advanced control and uh, AI algorithms. And that's a, a lesson that we can carry forward in our work. Now, again, there are many ways to think about the organization of a quantum computer. And Will showed some uh, work that goes back to 2012 from Cody Jones and colleagues, but this is another way to slice the uh, abstraction layers in a quantum computer on the right-hand side. At the top, of course, you have the operating system and the user interface, uh, maybe cloud-based. At the bottom, you have the physical hardware, the devices, the control electronics, and the like. Our efforts reside in something that we like to call the quantum firmware layer. This is the lowest layer of software abstraction above the hardware. It is the layer that attaches the physical devices. And remember those devices can be both the quantum and the classical aspects of it, but it connects the physical devices up to the higher levels of software abstraction. And this is a natural place for us to look at stabilizing and automating the operation of hardware with AI. And so in what follows, I'm going to tell you about uh, three different ways that you can do this in the quantum firmware layer. The first is the deployment of robust control for quantum logic that reduces the need for manual intervention and calibration. So we're going to try to make our systems more resilient against all the degradation sources that are uh, surrounding it. The next is the use of closed loop AI driven optimization in order to automate some of the manual tune-up tasks that we face. Now, these are things that are not so bad when we're dealing with one or two qubits, but as we scale to dozens or hundreds or thousands or more, these challenges become real bottlenecks in the operation of our system. And last, we're going to talk about completely autonomous, uh, human-free design of quantum logic operations uh, with performance that surpasses the best human design gates using learning control, using reinforcement learning on a quantum computer in runtime. Uh, and if you're more interested in understanding the quantum firmware layer and its role in the quantum computing stack, this was the, the cover story of uh, the March 2021 Physics Today edition. So let's start with that first step, using robust control in quantum algorithms. What we fundamentally begin with here is a task of redefining the quantum logic operations, the building blocks of quantum algorithms in order to gain resilience against the sources of degradation that we see. Now, these diagrams, if you're not familiar, because I know we have a, a diverse audience here, uh, they involve uh, individual qubits. That's each of the horizontal lines you see. And then each of these uh, boxes with a, with a letter in it represents a, a mathematical logic operation that you would perform on that qubit. Of course, you also have conditional logic, but this is a mathematical abstraction. Ultimately, we are always performing some form of light matter interaction. We are, in, we are interacting a, a superconducting circuit as we just heard about, or, or a quantum dot with say microwaves um, or a quasi DC signal, or we're applying pulses of laser light to a trapped ion or neutral atom system. There's always that form of physical manipulation of the device that we're interested in. And in this approach to using robust control, we're going to redefine those light matter interactions in such a way that we achieve the same mathematical operation. We achieve an X gate or an S or an H or a C naught, but we're going to do it now in a way that is resilient against the error sources such that we can make the system more autonomous, require less manual intervention. How does this work? This is a bit for the experts. 
if you have a total system Hamiltonian that involves the coupling of your light and your matter, and you have a noise term, we're going to choose the definition of our control Hamiltonian such that we actually cancel out the presence of the noise term. Now on this very trivial example of a qubit that's being driven from the North Pole to the South Pole on the block sphere, of course, the simplest path is to apply a square pulse where we drive from a along a meridian from, from the North Pole to the South Pole. But instead by taking a slightly more convoluted path that exploits some mathematical symmetries of this uh, vector space, we can actually design the control to cancel out certain noise terms. Now this always turns into a definition of a waveform for the light that's going to be used. In, this, uh, in most of the experiments I'll tell you about today, these are going to be pulses of microwave radiation that are used to uh, create either uh, individual single qubit gates or entangling conditional logic gates. And because we're using microwave gates, it's convenient to decompose these into the IQ basis, as we saw before. Very common in, in microwave engineering, it's just a uh, you know, complex notation uh, uh, means of um, denoting the waveforms, the modulation waveforms. And so everything we're going to be focused on is choosing that control term correctly, and that is the IQ decomposition of the, of the waveform that we're gonna use to modulate the microwaves in order to create those robust quantum logic gates. Now, the, the next question is how do you do it? There are of course, analytic prescriptions you can look into. Uh, that go back to the 1950s and 60s in nuclear magnetic resonance. And they work very well in certain cases, but they're not very efficient. And so we're gonna focus on numeric AI designed uh, model-based approaches to this. So first we're gonna do it mathematically, and then you're gonna see how we can do this using closed loop feedback. So one of the things that, that we built at QControl was a, uh, a programming framework that allows us to integrate some advanced machine learning tools into control design and optimization. This is based on something called a directed acyclic graph. Now, uh, I wanted to throw this in because in our field, there's just as much need for innovation in the way we design some of the software as there is in the way we design uh, algorithms and hardware elements. What, what was needed here? I mean, there are lots of optimizers out there. Uh, we wanted to build uh, a framework that allowed undertaking of all the critical tasks in controlling quantum systems that involves optimization and performance verification and simulation, all these things using, using one framework. And it's conveniently done using this graph-based approach where each node in the graph, whether it's a node that represents an objective function or an operation or a classical control knob that we have access to is simply represented uh, in code as, as one node in that, that graph that we create with this pretty simple command. Now, why this is really nice is that you can have all sorts of connectivity between different nodes in the graph. If anybody's ever tried to do a constrained optimization with SciPy or something, it's actually very difficult to get the right constraints. And it's even harder to do this if you have nonlinear relationships between say a control knob and then the Hamiltonian term uh, or cross couplings. These things make uh, the optimization problem very difficult. This particular approach makes it pretty simple uh, in part because it builds compatibility with a lot of the tools of the trade in the AI field, in particular, the use of TensorFlow in the background to perform some of the, um, uh, the gradient calculations uh, for those of you who are, who are experts in this. Now, if you'd like to, to hear more about that, you know this was written up in the, in the TensorFlow blog from Google as well as their Google Cloud blog. But this is the approach we're going to take to represent the mathematical problem and then execute using machine learning the design of our control solutions. The next step is to actually implement them on hardware. So we, we create that control design and then we want to program them. Uh, the framework that we use uh, here and throughout many of the experiments is something called Qiskit Pulse. This is a, a framework in which you program not just the, uh, the simple building blocks of a quantum algorithm, not just the X's and Z's and H's and S's, but rather the analog waveforms that are used to implement those physical manipulations. And again, we're always choosing them designed in that, in that model uh, to cancel out the noise term. And the noise terms that we're going to worry about are dephasing noise that come from off resonance errors, they're qubit and microwave are detuned from one another, amplitude errors that come from uh, drifts in the microwave amplitude, the classical electronics, and also leakage outside the qubit subspace. That then gets executed over the cloud uh, using uh, the Qiskit Pulse framework uh, on IBM's hardware. So here's a very simple demonstration of how this can work. 
The graph on the right is showing the actual waveform that comes out from, uh, from our machine learning based uh, or AI based optimization engine. It's designed to enforce symmetry, to enforce uh, a band limit. So this is a constraint we can apply. We, we don't want uh, transitions that are too fast. Otherwise they get distorted as they're sent down the transmission lines in the fridge uh, and the like. And when we do these, we've designed this particular gate to be resilient against uh, detuning errors, that is off resonance errors, and also a form of amplitude error. So let's, let's look at what happens when we perform experiments on this, just as an illustration of, of how this works. What we're plotting is the measured error. So it's a probability to be in the wrong state effectively on a single qubit. Uh, and on the x-axis is a detuning error. So in the center, there's no error. We're, we're right on resonance with our qubit. And as we move away from the center, we're adding an error. So this is deliberately adding an error in this case. For the standard gates, which are drag pulses, again, for the experts in the, in the field, uh, you see that as you move away from being on resonance, you rapidly increase your error, the probability of being in the wrong state at the end of your operation. But the robust pulses show that even in the presence of very large deviations in the frequency of the microwaves from resonance, you still get a high fidelity state transition. You stay at the, at the fidelity that uh, in this case is limited by spanners in this particular measurement. Now, if anybody comes from the NMR background, this is not a, you know, an unfamiliar kind of graph. This is widely used in characterizing uh, resilient uh, pulses like corpse and BB1, if, if you're familiar with that. But the, the key question here is what happens when we take these now validated robust pulses designed by a, a machine learning agent and we implement them in the hardware under native conditions? So this is what this graph is showing. Let's start at the top here. What we're looking at is the fidelity or the probability of error as a function of the number of times we repeat a particular gate. So we, we apply that pulse uh, that's, for instance, going to drive us on the North Pole to the South Pole of the block sphere. We repeat it many times, and we look at how well we end up where we think we're going to end up. The black line is the IBM default, that drag pulse, and the three colored lines are three different uh, Q control, uh, robust optimized pulses. Now, the first thing is that being high on this graph is good. So you see that as you apply more and more pulses, uh, the Q control graph stay near the uh, pulses stay near the top of the graph, which is indicative of reduced overall error. And the, the IBM unfortunately uh, moves away, indicating that there's some error. There are five different plots here that correspond to five different qubits on this particular device. So a key observation here is that the kind of error we're seeing with the default pulses comes from instability in the system. It comes from something called drift that they recalibrate, anybody does this, they recalibrate the device. And then over time, the system gradually changes, changes from temperatures in the con classical control electronics. Air pressure actually does this too. When the, when the weather changes, you see uh, the microwave uh, outputs change at these very precise uh, or very fine levels. But what you also see is that the Q control pulses are not susceptible to these errors. Now we can extract an error from this using a formula that comes really from, from some work that Will Oliver had done a number of years ago uh, and extract an effective error per gate, uh, which combines an incoherent and a coherent part. Uh, and, and the key thing is that the error per gate is uh, on average across this particular device, six times better with the Q control pulses and up to an order of magnitude better um, when you use, uh, when you compare uh, on a single qubit. The next part of this is to look a little bit more closely about that question of stability and time. What we want in large scale systems is systems that can just keep running without the need for constantly manually intervening in order to retune, to turn the knobs in order to make the system perform better. Now, on the color scale here, I'm plotting the same thing I showed on the graph uh, uh, on the right here. This graph is showing error per gate, same thing in color scale here, okay? The x-axis is which qubit, the y-axis is now what is the day on which we perform that experiment? So the first thing to see is that even though the IBM pulses are calibrated every single day, at least once every 24 hours, sometimes once every 12 hours, uh, if you just look at a column here, you see there can be quite a lot of variability that uh, over time, the, uh, the, uh, over different days, the performance of the individual quantum logic operations vary quite significantly up to uh, a factor of five or 10 in their overall error rate. But when you look at the Q control pulses, not only are they lower in the absolute sense, they're actually more stable. In fact, if you look at the variability either across devices or across time, you see a 10X improvement. And in this particular case, these pulses are not recalibrated daily. They were recalibrated once 
on August 3rd. And then the same exact waveform is used again and again and again. And so you get better performance than the daily calibrated uh, default pulses by introducing this idea of robust control designed by a machine learning agent. So that's pretty cool. But what about taking away the, the model? What about using uh, AI to interact directly with our hardware in a way that can uh, assist in some of the automation? Well, so a, a lot of what we focus on is building autonomy by allowing AI agents to actually take control of the underlying hardware in a closed loop fashion. So anybody who comes from a systems engineering or excuse me, a control engineering background would, would first of all say, well, you know, closed loop stabilization is the de facto standard. So let's look at that. And, and this is uh, what I'll talk about in this next section. So here we allow our agents to connect directly with hardware. It, the agent is going to choose a test point to execute on the hardware. Uh, that will then be executed. A measurement result will be returned to the agent. And then the agent will decide what to do next. Now you can build your solutions many, many different ways, piecewise, constant, time slices. You can build it from synthesis of different basis functions that are smoothed. Uh, and then you can use many different agents in order to perform uh, that optimization. We offer, we offer a range of them. I'm going to show you experiments today that are primarily fo focused on Gaussian processes, simulated annealing, and at the end, reinforcement learning. One of the things that we had to do was ensure that the agents we built would work in real hardware. There are lots and lots of uh, experimental studies of using different kinds of uh, learning control or, or online optimizers. And there are many forms of, uh, uh, or excuse me, there are many studies of numerical approaches to say control optimization using different kinds of closed loop optimization. Uh, the benefit of a, of a numerical approach is that, you know, you're just limited by your CPU and not anything else. And in reality, when we're interacting, for instance, with these cloud-based computers, we're limited by the API latency of talking to the hardware. We send a command to the IBM hardware, say, or anybody else's hardware over Azure, Quantum, or, or Bracket, and you have to wait. And you have to wait a couple of seconds per command as the, uh, as the information is, uh, is moving through the web. Well, we wanted to make sure that our agents were compatible with that. And also the fact that in general, uh, experimental measurements are costly, right? So you, you want agents that converge rapidly and don't require hundreds of millions or billions of iterations in order to converge. You want them to converge in dozens of iterations. So we ended up having to do quite a bit of work to tune our agents this way and to accept what's called batch data. So you can ex execute multiple different test points and get multiple uh, corresponding uh, measurement outputs from the device and send them all to the agent at the same time to allow the agent to decide what to do in the next batch. It's a great way to overcome some of the hardware latencies. You only face one latency per batch instead of one per, per call. So let's go through a pretty simple uh, example here. Let's take one of these fancy pulses. It's an IQ modulated single qubit pulse and let's go through a calibration process. Uh, there are a couple of steps to this. Uh, there's three usually. First, you have to do some coarse scaling of what the Robbie rates are. You have to measure your coupling strength and get that uh, correspondingly correct. Uh, then you have to do uh, a balancing of the I and Q channels. These are baseband modulators that are not always zeroed at the same place and you have to make sure that the offsets are compensated. And then you'll do some very fine tuning using a very sensitive, what you might call error amplifying measurement that ensures that the overall amplitude of your pulses is just right to get very, very high fidelity at that many nines level of fidelity. Now, typically doing this will require performing thousands or tens of thousands of individual measurements. You do these 2D parameter scans, as I'll show you in a bit. We're going to replace all that with, uh, with AI agents. So let's look at, at that first step, the coarse qubit drive. Uh, let's say we want to find the microwave resonance and the pi time. That is the, uh, effectively a measure of the Robbie rate for your hardware. Typically, you can make these one-dimensional scans where you're scanning over the microwave resonance and then the Robbie rate, and you can iteratively go back and forth to ensure you're both on resonance so you get the right Robbie rate and that you're driving uh, the right amount such that you get the right curve here. Um, a lot of times people will do this with a Chevron diagram, right? So you'll, you'll scan these both 100 points by 100 points. That's 10,000 measurements, right? Uh, we're going to replace this with an agent that's going to be tasked with finding both the resonance and effectively the Robbie rate or the pi time uh, in, in one single 
step. Now, this happens to be performed on a trapped ion machine uh, in my academic team, but uh, it's the same on, on uh, superconducting devices. So here we define a cost function, which is very simple. We just ask the optimizer to maximize the, the probability of being in a particular state averaged over multiple measurements. And we allow a Gaussian process optimization routine to iteratively interact with the hardware in that closed loop. And when we do this, we find both the microwave frequency and the pi time in about 100 measurements. So this vertical axis here is the fractional offset from what we know to be the, the correct value because we can do it manually too to cross check. And you can start off being you know 50% away from what your uh, ideal gate duration and, uh, and microwave frequency are. So like really quite far away in microwave frequency. And you see that the system will, will rapidly converge. Right now, this is this is cool. It's a it's a great first step of using uh, a cal an automated agent to do something very simple. Um, let's take that next step. Here, we're going to simultaneously balance the I and Q and get the fine tuning correct. The parameterization of our waveform comes with these two different uh, gains, if you will, S amp and S rel. Uh, rel S rel is going to tell us the, the imbalance between I and Q and S amp is going to tell us the overall scaling. And so again, we do a two dimensional automated optimization where the cost function is now again defined as you know the probability being in the right state, but we have to do some error amplification. We can't be spam limited in the system. This is back on an, on an IBM system. Uh, so that means that we have to do a weighted average in our cost of experiments with different numbers of repetitions. So we apply the gate, uh, I think 21 times and then 81 times or something like that. Uh, we perform this weighted average. And when we do this batched uh, optimization in just four steps of the optimizer, we're able to find the overall tuning. So what we've seen, is that by using AI agents, we've broken it up into two steps just for simplicity. They can be combined. Uh, it's easier to, to talk through it here this way. But now we've taken a, a, this calibration process, which we usually take tens, uh, thousands or tens of thousands of measurements, and we've turned it into less than 200. So this is a, an important way we can really save on uh, both processing power and time and the like in tuning up these devices. Obviously, this can be scaled across whole chips. But single qubit gates that I've talked about so far are not usually our bottleneck. Um, typically in the superconducting devices, you get to 99.9%. .9%. In my trapped ion lab, we're at four by 10 to the minus six. So, you know, five nines and a, and a, and a six there in our, in our uh, fidelity. Um, it's really the two qubit gates that are the bottleneck. And I think it's important to say that uh, we sometimes hear quotes of the best performing two qubit gates, which often are at the 99.5% or, or better level. But the typical gates uh, across a large multi qubit device uh, can be much worse. Uh, they can be, you know, one or two percent, sometimes even higher. Uh, and 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 for anybody who's familiar with error correction, we know that it's the worst case error, not the best case error, that really matters. So we're interested in looking at improving two qubit gates as a critical next step to engaging in you know, real meaningful improvements in quantum computers. The real challenge that we face is that often the physical description of our device is, is completely, in, is, well, is completely incomplete, I was about to say. Uh, it is incomplete. Um, in some cases, it's just wrong. So as, a, as an example, we're going to do some analysis here where we apply standard, what are called cross resonance pulses to an IBM system uh, through program through Qiskit Pulse. And then we're just gonna look at the dynamic evolution of the system uh, and compare the, the markers, which are experimental measurements uh, against the lines, the dashed lines, which are the simulation that comes out of the IBM backend. Uh, and the different colors are different state projections uh, for, for this two qubit manifold, it doesn't really matter very much. The, the important thing to take away here is that during the course of the gate, that's the X axis here time, uh, you don't get very good match between the measured dynamics and the predicted dynamics. Now, it's kind of intuitive to say this might happen. We're sending a, 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 some pulse definition. This is just a square pulse. It's the simplest thing you can do uh, through an AWG that a, a arbitrary waveform generator is imperfect. It then goes through control lines, which can have distortions and band limits, it goes to packaging, which can have reflections and other distortions. And then it goes to the quantum system and the quantum system may suffer from crosstalk and other couplings that are not accounted for. So we end up in a situation 
where our total system Hamiltonian is not known. This is not just there's some unknown coupling rate we have to calibrate. There are terms in the Hamiltonian we just do not have uh, at hand. Yet we want to design controls that are extremely high fidelity in the system. So how can we do it in an efficient way? Uh, this is where we're going to deploy learning control. This is a, a way that we've devised uh, uh, to allow again an AI agent to interact with a quantum system to design a universal gate set autonomously. So it does not require human intervention. This diagram is similar to what I showed you before, but those of you with a keen eye will note that there's an extra bit of a, a loop in here because now we're talking about something called deep reinforcement learning. And instead of just a black box closed loop optimizer where we simply try to maximize some objective function, now we're going to have two parts of this. Because yes, indeed, we want to maximize what's called the reward here, um, which is going to be a proxy for fidelity of the gates we design, whether they're one qubit or two qubit or whatever. But in learning control, the agent actually builds up systematic understanding of what each individual action it can apply does. So instead of just applying a bunch of tests and seeing what comes out and finding the one that's the best, it's going to try to learn how to design optimized controls. We do that with a set of state observables at intermediate times, in addition to the reward function, uh, which is uh, our fidelity. And of course, this is done by the agent interacting directly with the environment, which is the quantum computer. So let's look a little bit more closely at how we implement this. Um, one thing uh, to note is that we're going to compose our pulses for this particular set of experiments as piecewise constant functions. So we put in uh, individual time slices and at each time slice, the system, it's called a step, the, the AI agent is gonna perform a measurement of the state of the resulting system and choose the next action. When it's composed a complete set of time slices that, that gives you a complete gate, a test gate, that is called an episode. And then at that point you measure the reward function. You don't measure the reward at these intermediate times. But at these intermediate times, you're getting insight into how the dynamics of the system change. Now, you may say, well, you're doing these piecewise constant pulses. Isn't that going to look crazy? Uh, don't forget, the agent knows what the qubits feel, right? It's not just um, what we're applying. It's what the qubits feel after all the distortions and the like. The measurement process will involve a simplified form of uh, tomography. And then the reward is going to be, again, a weighted average of the fidelities at different time, at different uh, uh, repetition numbers in order to first overcome spam in the system and second uh, to uh, uh, address the fact that there can be pathologies like certain gate repetitions might hit some crazy resonance in the system and you don't want to, uh, to distort your learning agent by uh, being uh, uh, led astray there. So here's, here's a simple demo. With these deep reinforcement learning agents, uh, the agent will design a pulse that outperforms the best analytic gates. Uh, they get down to T1 limits and they achieve better than 99.5% fidelity. Now, in this case, we're talking about a 20 dimensional optimization that the system conducts uh, in just about 200 episodes. So it's a very efficient uh, convergence here. Um, and we also do this in a simplified fashion where we've taken out some of the controls that are otherwise nominally needed in the system. Another cool thing about this is that the AI agent can learn robustness. It can gain superior performance 25 days post-design, uh, even though what we designed initially um, uh, uh, is going to be competing against something that's recalibrated every day. So it's a really cool uh, bit of what goes on in this system. You can also do these designs in situ and show that you can get benefits uh, when you're designing swap operations. So here's a complicated multi-qubit uh, um, and uh, simple, excuse me, a simple circuit with a complicated structure that involves swapping information between two qubits. You can use both interleave randomized benchmarking and simple repetition measurements that I'm showing on the left-hand side to show that the overall swap operation can be up to 50% better than uh, what you get with the default approach. Uh, this was the topic of an IBM Open Science Challenge. We happened to, to beat the best entry by about four times, even though we didn't uh, formally enter. But then, you know, all those things need to be combined together. You need to put all these pieces together in order to calibrate a whole system. 
And so uh, here's a snapshot of doing parallel autonomous optimization device-wide across a five qubit uh, chip. You, you tune up using these automated agents, uh, uh, the non-connected pairs of qubits. Um, you can show that you can get benefits to the T1 limits. The benefits in this particular device were about a factor of uh, 50%. In others, it's two or three X. And then what you can do is you can take all of the optimized uh, two qubit gates, put them together into an algorithm and ask how well does the algorithm now perform? So here's an example where we perform a quantum Fourier transform. And in this quantum Fourier transform, we end up getting uh, about a 30% improvement in algorithmic success just by doing drop-in replacement of the gates uh, that are used in the IBM system with the Q control optimized pulses. Now, not all the gates get better because some of them are right at the T1 limits already, but even when about uh, 50 or 60% of the gates get better, you can translate that directly into an improvement in the success probability of an algorithm. And there are opportunities for really large gains as we push to shorter and shorter pulses to overcome some of these T1 limits. So uh, at this point, I wanted to stop to make sure we left some time for questions, if there are any. Um, I've told you about how we can introduce AI into quantum computer operation and design. I've told you about some work that we've done on error-resilient quantum logic on IBM quantum computers and using autonomous agents, reinforcement learning and direct closed loop optimization in order to discover gate sets, optimize them, and then deploy them in algorithms in order to get better performance from near-term quantum computers. I'll end there with just a little bit of advertising. Uh, Q-Control is a is super exciting place to work. Uh, we have offices in Sydney and Los Angeles, and we're currently opening an office in Berlin. And so if you're interested, uh, please get in touch. And we're very keen to build greater interactions, not only with our uh, commercial partners like Zapata, but also uh, with the university sector where we're very keen to uh, uh, continue engaging with our uh, fundamental research partners uh, in both experiment and theory. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you once more for the invitation. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the live audience here first? We do have one. Hi there, I'm uh, Kathy McGue. I work for D-Wave and I'm, I'm just kind of curious about the overhead of all the control, you know, doing machine learning and, and, um, and all, you know, the sort of classical computation, what, how much of a percentage of the computation does it, does it uh, account for? Yeah, it's actually, uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, so the first thing is we're saving a factor of 10 to 100x on measurements and measurements are the real bottleneck uh, in most of these experiments. The AI agents are pretty efficient. Um, when we, for instance, performed the deep reinforcement learning agent, um, it was about 30, 30 minutes to optimize a gate and about 27 minutes of that was waiting in the API latency. So getting into the IBM hardware, the, uh, the actual calculation time uh, for you know, determining by the agent what happens next is uh, is uh, short even compared to just the physical measurement duration. So uh, so the overhead is is quite light. This is a key part of the design criteria for the way we built these agents. Any others from here? Any online? Well, I have one if that's okay here. Um, one uh, aspect of uh, using kind of neural network based or AI based approaches is model explainability. And I'm wondering if you have any insights into that. Is that something that you're working on to find out what maybe features you can extract from this model that could be used then directly in a control loop, which, which, which would take away some of the computational um, uh, part of this. And secondly, specific to some of my interests are, uh, we had a talk from Emily at IBM uh, earlier um, uh, where she briefly mentioned leakage. Leakage is something that doesn't get a lot of uh, talk in, in our community. Uh, it's not the big problem right now. The big problem is something else. And, and my question is, you know, uh, have you found anything from this uh, regarding leakage from model explainability and, and methods to actually address it that maybe we could utilize in the field? 
Yeah, this is a fantastic question. Um, so let me deal with the second part first. Uh, the reward function actually does account for leakage here. We perform a measurement of uh, not just the qubit subspace or the two qubit subspace, but also leakage out of the qubit manifold. Um, uh, so when we do reinforcement learning for single qubit operations, we actually find gates that can be three times faster than a default drag pulse, but actually not suffer any additional leakage. So there's something going on. Now, what's going on? Um, well, this is, this is harder to say. Uh, we use uh, various different agents, the particular kind we're using. It's a deep neural network that uses something called policy gradient. Uh, it is building a policy, which is really some kind of model between the input and the output. But human interpretability is a tougher task that it's difficult to understand exactly what that policy is representing physically. In order to, to better address that question, we're looking specifically at using uh, reinforcement learning agents in with uh, reduced models of complex interacting systems in order to learn physically motivated parameters uh, that might be proxy measures for what's going on in the system. Uh, as opposed to just trying to interpret the outputs of this uh, of this policy, which uh, you know it's effectively not human interpretable. So you can find at least some grouped parameterized. You you, you absolutely you absolutely perhaps. can use the learning control agents to uh, discover what the right models are. This is a task in control theory called uh, system identification, and we are actively using. Uh, deep reinforcement learning agents uh, in that context right now. Others, if not, a warm round of applause and thank you to Michael for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay, one more. And I forgot my uh, speaker notes here, but maybe I have it in my pocket. Sure. So one more. Sergio, you're with us. I gotta get your, uh, your bio out here. I should be able to do this by memory by now, but I cannot. Well, no, I don't have it here. Let me go back and grab it. Glenn, do you have it? So joining us from beautiful California, <laughs> we have uh, Sergio uh, from Google. Uh, Sergio uh, Boiso leads uh, the quantum computer science group at Google Quantum AI. He was previously a research professor and quantum engineer at USC and a postdoc at Harvard and Caltech. Uh, Sergio has a doctorate in physics from UNM, a master's degree in physics from UAB, and, a, and is a computer engineer from UCM and studied mathematics and philosophy at UNED. Previously, Sergio worked as a computer engineer at the European Central Bank and other companies before embarking on this career. And, uh, and as you may know, for some of the lay people as well, for, uh, he is uh, running the theory group that was behind that paper that we've heard uh, in numerous talks uh, today, one of the authors of the, uh, the Google um, so-called supremacy. Uh, paper. So uh, almost every talk, including mine, mentioned it. So you're you're now um, for our um, last but not least uh, presentation, able to hear right from the horse's mouth uh, about some of the work that's going on at Google. So warm round of uh, uh, applause for uh, Sergio. And thank you for, for, for doing this for us. I know you would have loved to be in person, but again, we have the COVID restrictions that are right. causing some problem for all of us. Yes, it's still a bit difficult to travel and get exceptions at the office with all the protocols. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. I will certainly wish to be there, but I couldn't. Uh, let me share my screen and start the presentation. If um, Okay, can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Right, so yes, I'm gonna talk about, um, well, beyond classical computation, uh, which is uh, what we say now instead of quantum supremacy, and indeed things we have been doing at Google um, after that 
experiment. So first, I want to acknowledge uh, the big team that we have. Here's a, a COVID photo of everybody at home and sharing the screens. Uh, we are also growing. So here's a link to apply for the different jobs that we offer. Um, as a way of introduction for the team and where we are, well, most of the team, 80% of the team is located in sunny Santa Barbara, uh, where there are now like three buildings, including uh, clean rooms and, and, and labs. So we do a start, we, we fabricate some of our own devices, but I am actually based in LA where we have most of the theory computer science work uh, in that building, which is um, in, in Venice Beach in LA. Okay, so we used uh, superconducting qubits. So superconducting qubits are microfabricated. They are kind of artificial atoms and they get quantized and and then you have a qubit. If you work on the two lower energy levels, uh, there is a justice on junction to introduce a nonlinearity. So the energy difference between the first two levels is different from like the first level and the second level. Uh, so that way you try to avoid leakage and problems like that. So, uh, otherwise you couldn't work as a qubit. And there are artificial atoms where they're kind of mesoscopic. They have like 10 to the 20 atoms in their quantum state. So um, um, they tend to have more decoherence than other uh, implementations of quantum computing because they are kind of these complicated mesoscopic objects in sort of solid state. Uh, but the advantage is that we have good control. So there is this jing and jang I used to say in quantum computing for on the one hand you want, of course, low decoherence, that's a big problem. So you want the qubits to be isolated, but on the other hand, you want to do computation. You don't want to end up with a neutrino qubit, which is very coherent, but you cannot control it. Uh, so it's hard to find the equilibrium between these two tendencies. Superconducting qubits, I think, well, they are lower in coherence for sure, but they are higher in control. And again, we emphasize control, and that's why we work with superconducting qubits at all, because most of what goes into building a quantum computer has to do with control, and that follows nicely the previous talk. Um, so the chip where we have the superconducting qubits will actually is kind of a one centimeter chip that will go here at the bottom of a dilution refrigerator. Uh, but a lot of the work happens here on the FPGAs uh, where we have all these cables with microwave signals that will send, well, the microwave signals that control the operations that we want to do in qubits. So again, uh, more controllable and, and, and in that sense, more scalable. We can, you know, lay out a 2D surface of superconducting qubits and we can control all of them. We can control the tunable couplers now. And in principle, we can scale up. Um, we will need more cables, but, you know, nothing prevents us from scaling up to more qubits, except that they are kind of too noisy for now. So is this, uh, we're focusing more on the improving the fidelity, improving the control, and low in decoherence than actually scaling for now. So I'll talk about that later. Okay, so yes, I we, we published this experiment in 2019, which was the first demonstration of a billion classical computation or, or quantum supremacy. And the idea is that for the first time, we were able to do a well-defined computational task on an experimental quantum processor, uh, which is beyond was beyond the practical capabilities of a state-of-the-art supercomputers. So the idea of this task was very simple. Uh, we, uh, because we are interested in universal quantum computation, our, our long-term roadmap, as I will explain, is a full-term quantum computer. So we have a 2D layout of superconducting qubits where we can implement in universal quantum gates. So the idea is to implement a random quantum circuit well, why random? Uh, because the random quantum circuits are sort of the hardest to simulate for classical computers. If the quantum circuit is not random, well, if you're doing factoring, then you wouldn't actually simulate the quantum circuit at all because there are more efficient classical algorithms to factor than just simulating a quantum circuit. But if you are doing a circuit with any structure, then in general, you will find some, some emulations. You will find a way to do the computation in a classical computer 
cheaper than just simulating the quantum circuit. But if it's random, and if it's random enough, then you can actually not find shortcuts. You cannot find emulation. So you're kind of forced to simulate the circuit. So then we, we implement a random circuit. We sample the output of the quantum circuit. And what, what we do on the next slide, we'll explain a bit more, is we estimate the fidelity. So the fidelity, which is in this case, the probability of not having an error anywhere, it's a very sensitive measure. Uh, of the probability of error. If you have an error anywhere, a discrete error, the fidelity goes to zero. So we managed to introduce a metric that estimates the fidelity. And the idea is, well, if we are sampling with a fidelity beyond what you can do with a classical supercomputer, then we're doing something which is beyond classical, something that, you know, well-defined computational task, sampling the output of a random circuit with fidelity larger than something, 0.2% uh, or whatever it is. Uh, beyond what you can simulate or reproduce with a supercomputer. Okay, so it was very important to introduce this metric for us, um, which we use all the time now. It's, it's, it's a useful metric, not just for large random circuits, but for general two qubit gates, and actually uh, to improve our control, right? So you always want to improve the control, which is sort of a machine learning problem, how you need to have some mapping of input and outputs. And this metric, cross entropy, Benchmarking works for any gate, so it's a good metric to find the, uh, the control map and, and try to improve our controls. So the way the metric works in general, uh, cross-entropy benchmarking, the way this estimator of fidelity works is, well, you are going to sample, if you have a random circuit, the probabilities of the bit strings that you sample are a mixture between the ideal probabilities, which we call PCS, for the ideal probability of that bit string S, uh, pro with a factor here, which is the fidelity, plus something, which is one minus the fidelity, the noise, right? And if the circuit is random, then uh, this noise becomes uncorrelated with ideal probabilities. So using basically a version of concentration of measure or the central limit theorem, then we can average the noise out without knowing details, without knowing too many details about how the noise exactly looks like. It kind of solves average out whatever the noise is. So that allow us to solve for fidelity in this equation because the noise gets approximated by a globally depolarizing channel. So long story short, now we're just gonna have an equation where we know the ideal probability uh, of the beta strings and we know the uh, we want to estimate the fidelity and the noise gets self average out so we can get an estimate of the fidelity and in the for large circuits these estimates because we use properties of harmless or, or universal circuits then the fidelity just becomes this very simple measure so we we sample a bunch of the strings we calculate with a classical supercomputer or a big cluster the ideal probabilities. Well, if it's a small circuit, then of course you can do it with your laptop or whatever. So if you're just calibrating two qubit gates, we calculate the ideal probabilities and then we average this way. This is the dimension of Hilbert space. So four, if it's just um, two qubit gates. And this outputs the fidelity. But this is a very general procedure. I mean, this is a particular estimator based on this idea that you can average, the, the noise self averages if it's a random circuit. So we have other estimators as well, like logarithmic cross entropy or um, some normalized version of uh, hog, things like that. They're just different estimators. So actually in the experiment, what we do, and this is important, is we do multiple estimators of the fidelity and we make sure that they agree. So there is nothing confusing or funky in some probabilities being weighted more than others, which basically comes if your circuit is not random enough. Anyway, so this is a slightly, you know, maybe a complicated slide, but the general idea is that this is a, a generic technique that we use all the time now in the lab uh, to estimate the fidelity, and that's what we do in the experiment. Uh, we run uh, with sample bit strings with a random circuit implemented with some fidelity that we can estimate. Okay, so that's actually what we did in 2019, and here you have estimators, estimations of the fidelity for different depths. This was with 53 qubits. And we see that, of course, the fidelity decays exponentially um, with the depth. Actually, the depth is, this is these are what we call cross entropy cycles. And one of these cycles is a layer of single qubit gates and a layer of two qubit gates to randomize faster. So the depth was actually twice as much in terms of moments or clock cycles. Um, in any case, the, the idea is that, well, the fidelity should decrease exponentially with depth because the fidelity here is the probability of not having an error anywhere. It's very sensitive. 
and every gate has some finite fidelity. So the more gates you put, the exponentially lower probability you have that none of the gate fails anywhere. So that's what we see, that the fidelity decreases exponentially. The black line is just a very simple model where we multiply the probability of no error for all the gates, and it fits pretty well the data. And the, um, the well, the data point that we have here, those elided and patch circuits are basically simplifications of the full circuit, because to estimate, to do cross entropy benchmarking, you need the ideal probability. So for the full circuit, we didn't know how to do that. We actually put some estimates with the methods that we know or everybody knew in 2019. We thought it will take like 600 years to get this point. And these methods have improved a lot. The next slide will tell you where we are. Of course, there was a, a, a recent paper actually this year where we do, they, they did uh, in USDC, basically the same experiment with a very similar architecture in superconducting qubits and they get a similar result. They have a few more qubits, so they have a, a kind of a lower fidelity. If you notice the axis, they go below um, 0.1 percent fidelity, but this is similar result, which is encouraging because again, this is a very similar architecture, superconducting qubits with tunable couplers, that version of transponds. So it's reproducible. We're, we have a good handle with the technology. It's a technology that we understand is reproducible and, and we, you know, we're trying to indeed move towards fault tolerance. Uh, so I said, uh, I will mention the large improvements in in classical algorithms. And this is something that I think is important when you're, I mean, the, the idea why we do this experiment, well, there are you know, multiple reasons that we, we thought this experiment was important. But one reason is that, and I'll talk more about this later as well. If you really want to find real world applications, then you're, you, pro, you want to do something that you cannot reproduce with a classical computer most of the time. I mean, there are actually scientific experiments that you can do, even if you can reproduce them with a classical computer, that's fine. But to really bring practical applications, you probably want to beat classical computers at something. And again, this particular experiment was designed to be the first experiment where we can surpass classical computers at one particular well-defined task. But of course, classical algorithms improve. We mentioned this in our paper because it always happens too, right? And they have improved a lot. So if you're interested in classical simulation algorithms, in part um, motivated by this work on random circuit sampling, the methods to simulate quantum circuits has improved, have improved a lot. The leading method right now is tensor networks. There were problems on tensor networks. We actually did the first implementation. This was a you know, theoretical paper that introduced the idea of simulate quantum circuits with tensor networks a long time ago, 2005. We did the first implementation before a paper in 2017, but there are several problems in tensor networks that we didn't know how to solve, and they have been solved basically since then. So tensor networks are becoming pretty optimized. One big problem was something called the contraction ordering, basically how you order the operations to do your tensor network. And that has an exponential effect on the computational cost. That was kind of solved by uh, Gray and Curtis last year. And there have been other papers, mostly from Alibaba, on how to distribute these complicated tensor networks in clusters, which we didn't know how to do again either in 2018. And finally, well, a new paper that just came out a couple of months ago where it shows how to improve the cost by reducing tensors. So it's kind of technical, all these improvements, but this code again is now the most efficient method to simulate quantum circuits, at least sort of large circuits with a lot of qubits, but low death, which is sort of the boundary where you're doing things that cannot be simulated classically. And, and it's becoming more of a commodity. It's, it's, it's becoming better understood and there is open source code like Cotingra, for instance, from Johnny Gray and uh, uh, Quim allows you to do a lot of this stuff is open source. Anyway, very impressive result this year in August. With all these improvements, they were actually able to get um, this group from um, Russia and China. They were able to uh, get the fidelity for some of these circuits that we were not able to estimate the fidelity. So I, I mentioned for depth 12 and depth 14 with 53 qubits, we ran the full circuit, we put out all the beta strings that we measured, but we didn't know how to calculate the ideal probabilities. So we did uh, some simplification of the circuits, we removed some gates, we got the fidelity of the simplified circuits, but not the full circuits. So for depth 12 of 14, now uh, there, you know, people have been able to get the fidelities very close to what 
we estimate it. Uh, so everything is works well. But I think this is, you know, an important, impressive result that this network tensor network method has caffeine proof enough to actually um, calculate the fidelity of some of these circuits. Okay, so other things going on in this beyond classical world, meaning again. Uh, this boundary where you're starting to do things that you cannot do with a classical computer, which again, I think is critical if you find, if you want to find practical applications, right? You want to do things that you cannot do with classical computers. So there is random circuit sampling. This is our uh, experiment that we published. And uh, I mentioned this particular experiment from USTC. But USTC, uh, which is a very large group, uh, well-funded. Um, they also have been working on Gaussian boson sampling. And I won't say a lot about Gaussian boson sampling. It's actually, well, the idea of Gaussian boson sampling is also a sampling problem. So you want to do something similar than random circuits, where you know, in random circuits, you implement a random circuit, and then you just sample the output. In boson sampling, you implement, uh, you have bosons, and you implement some kind of random linear interferometer of the bosons, and then you sample the output. And the original idea of boson sampling is, well, these sampling probabilities are proportional to permanence, which we know are very hard in, to compute in the average case classically. Uh, so then boson sampling is probably very hard. Uh, nevertheless, this is not quite the original boson sampling. This is Gaussian boson sampling. And I'm not going to get into the details, but that means that it incorporates loss of truth. So you have to be careful, because when you start introducing errors as part of your ideal distribution. And when you measure, the, the, the measure that you make is not very sensitive to errors, then it's probably uh, also something that you can try to approximate with classical algorithms. So I mentioned for random circuits, what we measure is the fidelity. And the fidelity is very, very sensitive. If you make an error anywhere, the fidelity goes to zero. So the tensor network methods have improved a lot but they're still exponential, it's exponential cost, right? Uh, so that's why, you know, uh, even though classical algorithms improve, they're still exponential. If you add some qubits, you are, again, out of the reach of classical algorithms. But in boson sampling, especially in Gaussian boson sampling, but in boson sampling in general, uh, there is nothing like fidelity that we know. You only measure things that are not very sensitive to errors. And actually, even the ideal distribution includes, again, photon loss in the case of Gaussian boson sampling. So you have to be very careful about competing not just with exact algorithms like tensor networks, but approximate algorithms. So uh, sorry. Um, uh, in this case, well, there are two papers. In the first paper, they have 100 output modes. And in the second paper, 144 output modes. So we just published a, a, a paper in the archive where this is what we exploit. We introduce an approximate classical algorithm. It's actually quadratic. It runs you know, on a laptop. It's very efficient, which gets at least up to, uh, there are some complicated extrapolations here, but at least up to the data that we were able to get, uh, gets better variational distance and better KL divergence than the experiment, meaning this classical approximation algorithm um, in the standard measures for approximate sampling seems to be doing better than the experiment. Uh, the experiment has something called higher order Herschel functions, which you know is a, is a different signal that you can get. So this uh, efficient mock-up sampler, at least this particular version, does not reproduce all the signals from the experiment, but it does very well on KL divergence and statistical distance. So again, the idea is, um, and I think this is general, you know, if you're trying to compete with quantum algorithms against classical algorithms, and your quantum algorithm is not very sensitive to errors, then you have to worry that the classical algorithms can do approximations and it's a you know, harder competition. OK, so I'm going to move towards starting to talk about NISC applications, uh, which are not just you know, sampling random circuits or boson sampling, which again is just the first frontier of where we can do something that you cannot reproduce classically, but you want to do more interesting things. And I think that in general, I will start by saying that quantum computing is a very exciting field right now because there is a lot of progress, uh, like we have heard on all the talks, uh, both experimentally and theoretically. Um, I think there are scientific applications in the next few years. And arguably now we're seeing already in very interesting scientific experiments performed with um, quantum computers and, and quantum annealers. And um, we have now 
when we're starting to see realistic roadmaps on how to build a photo and quantum computer, I think, you know, at Google, we have a fairly realistic roadmap. And there is a high payoff if we build up this. But we also know that all technologies, not just quantum computing, tend to go through these hype cycles, the Garnet cycle, where, you know, initially there are like very high expectations. And eventually you realize that expectations not are, you know, it's harder than it seems. I think actually the we might be on the second, approaching the second peak of high expectations in quantum computing. I think there was one, you know, in the late 90s. Uh, so we, you know, we have to be mindful of this, that not all expectations are going to be met in quantum computing like in any other technology. So um, I, I'm going to try to do a little bit of, you know, setting expectations uh, to the best of my ability. So at, at least in the NISC era, which are these noisy uh, experimental quantum processors that we have right now, which are not fault tolerant. Um, so I think we are going to get a uh, very interesting scientific applications in the next few years and applications where we cannot, where we're doing things that you cannot simulate classically. Examples are, of course, random circuits that I was talking about. Even though the tensor networks algorithms have improved a lot, they, it's still exponentially expensive. So we can try to use random circuits for certified randomness or something called OTOC, informa quantum information scrambling, which is related to quantum gravity, um, things like that, right? So these are very interesting scientific applications. Um, and I put it in green because I think these are low risk. I think we're you know, approaching the boundary where we have real applications with random circuits. Um, I, I think we will also see, or we're starting to see scientific applications with the spin models and the Bosch Havar model because this maps well to our current implementations of uh, experimental quantum processors. So that's still green. And I think it has more, it might have more value, more impact than just versions of random circuits. I think, you know, there are interesting questions on spin models relating to diffusion of spin models, things like that. Uh, so next, um, we, I think, can be cautiously optimistic that we will see applications in fermionic simulation in chemistry. So I'm putting that in orange, meaning this higher risk. I think we're not sure that we're gonna be able to do this without a fault on quantum computer. And it's, but it certainly has more value than um, spin models because you know chemistry, of course, has a large industrial applications, right? And then in red, well, things like classical machine learning and classical optimization. So problems that are classical, I'm putting that in red, where I'm, you know, I'm not optimistic that we're going to see real applications um, in with noiseless, with, sorry, with NIST processors, and even with fault tolerant quantum processors is still difficult. And the main reason is, well, uh, in all these cases, we have an exponential speed up, right? We're, we're working, we're competing against classical algorithms, which is actually hard already, but at least we have an exponential separation. So in the case of random circuit sampling, we're competing with improving tensor networks, but, they're, but the computational cost is exponentially worse for tensor networks than actually running the processors. But in classical problems, um, that's not the case. We do not have right now any exponential speed up. That it would be great if we find an exponential speed up, but we just haven't been able to find one. And actually, you need a fairly big, uh, you know, quantum processor um, to be able to compete in classical optimization. Actually, uh, mostly I'm talking here about the discrete universal quantum computers, quantum annealers in optimization. I think you know they they can at, at least try to do benchmarking because they can scale better and they're very focused on optimization and errors don't affect them that much when they're doing optimization. But even in, in annealers, you have to worry about the geometry of the problem and, and, and things like that. So it's still hard to compete with, um, you know, classical algorithms. So I will, you know, it would be great if we call fine NISC applications in classical optimization, but I'm not optimistic that it's going to be the case. And even with fault tolerant quantum computers, if you just have a quadratic speed up and you actually make the numbers, it will still not be a real application because quantum computers are just much, they will be slower compared with classical computers. So even a quadratic speed up might not be good enough. Okay, uh, nevertheless, you know, we keep working on all these areas and we have a lot of, if you go to our website in quantum AI, we, you know, we have in addition to CERT, which is a general open source framework to 
program needs computers. We also have a specialized frameworks for things like machine learning, quantum chemistry, and we have a high performance simulation. So uh, we're trying to you know, help everybody and help ourselves finding applications because we think it's very important, of course, to find applications in NISC. So I'll mention um, two recent experiments that we have done. Uh, looking for applications um, which are not just random circuits or just sampling random circuits. One is information scrambling, with, which I mentioned. So this is how the quantum circuit looks like. Basically, you're trying to find how information travels from uh, one, let's say, bit flip that you put, which we call a butterfly gate that you put in some qubit. And as it evolves, if you want, in the Heisenberg picture, let's say, um, it will eventually, you know, the information about this bit flip will reach this other qubit. Uh, and we kind of measure how in quantum information um, expands through some unitary. We're going to choose a random unitary. This is uh, still interesting because information is scrambling how the quantum information grows, which is measured by this OTOC, out of time order correlators, is related to quantum gravity, um, you know, according to people that works in that field. So anyway, we do this experiment and um, we measure experimentally the this observable, which is an out of time order correlation. Uh, and what we do is, well, here in this plot, let's just start with the top plot, which is the autoc experiment. We measure the signal and the experimental error as a function of NS. NS is the number of I swaps basically in the quantum circuit which is kind of a measure of the complexity of the quantum circuit. The more eye swaps you have in these quantum circuits, the harder it is to simulate. And we see that we get a nice experimental signal up to around 230 eye swaps. Beyond that, there is too much noise because this is a noisy processor. Uh, we published this in November, by the way. And, um, and you don't get a signal anymore. So up to 230 eye swaps. But um, if we compare with simulations, and I don't have the plot here, we see that uh, we need to, well, we can do simulations with the later tensor networks in Summit, the second largest supercomputer. We could do simulations up to 420 I swaps. So we need to improve the error rates by a factor of two. If we improve the error rate by a factor of two, then we can do autoc information scrambling experiments in a regime that you cannot simulate even with a supercomputer. So we're not that far because, you know, we believe our rates, they have, you know, every few years. Okay, so that was an interesting experiment. Here is another interesting experiment, which is not really uh, looking at a very hard computation, but it's actually more of a, you know, physical realization of an interesting phenomena. So this is um, uh, the phenomena of a time crystal. We know that um, special crystals are, well, you know, they are orderings of, atoms um, that break symmetry in space. So they have a regular structure in space. So the symmetry is broken. The point where the atom is, is very different from a point half up, like this is spacing away, away. So somehow the material orders breaks the symmetry and you have a regular pattern. So time crystal, the idea is, well, you want to break the time symmetry. So you want to have also a, a regular pattern, but in time instead of a space. Um, so you break the, the symmetry in time. Um, this is, of course, also what a very simple oscillator will do. It, you know, it also has a pattern, a regular pattern in, a, in time. The difference, though, is that an oscillator is a system with low degrees of freedom, so it's not really a condensed matter system, whereas a time crystal is a complicated system with many degrees of freedom, and, and, and it's kind of uh, robust in a way. It's really like a phase transition. If you move the parameters a little bit, you will see the exactly the same oscillations. You, you can change the parameters and the system behaves in the same way because it's a, it's a phase transition. Okay, so we perform this experiment. And uh, basically the way you do the experiment is you start with um, these gates. Uh, so these are, you know, qubits, and time is going from left to right. And every qubit has kind of a bit flip, but not quite a bit flip. There is this parameter g, and it's very important that g is not equals to one. And actually, it doesn't really matter. Well, as long as g is larger than some threshold value, at least in the thermodynamic, in the thermodynamical limit, it doesn't matter what value of g you choose. Again, because this is a phase transition, right? So g equals one is trivial, but g equals 0.94 does not trivial anymore. So you choose some G in, in this range of value, and then you put um, 
random you know phases between the gates or random evolutions and again you don't have to be very sensitive about these values this this is sort of introduced disorder in the system uh, it turns out you can only have 10 crystal if you have many body localization for which you need disorder i'm not going to get into that but the point is that um for uh, values of g and phi h in some range you see these repeated oscillations. That's the, the plot on the right. Uh, so the x-axis is time. Those are the cycles. And the uh, y-axis is the, the qubits, so from 0 to 20 qubits. And sorry, you see that, um, well, the, the color here is the autocorrelation of the qubit with itself. And you see that uh, the autocorrelation oscillate. So whatever was the initial value of the qubit, the next cycle is flips, the cycle after that it flips in the opposite direction. And this pattern repeats. Uh, it's supposed to repeat in, you know, for infinite time, but we have the coherence, of course. So in this case, it repeats up to like 100 cycles very nicely. By the way, this data already includes some error mitigation techniques. So the, the observable that you measure is renormalized to remove noise, uh, even though you know this error mitigation will fail at some point. It won't you know, you won't see this oscillation up to infinity because eventually decoherence will overcome the system. But still, you have these very nice oscillations up to around 100 cycles. And people in the condensed matter community that kind of, you know, invented time crystals are excited about this experiment because it's a new experimental realization of um, a new phase of matter, right, according to them who are the experts. So this is, again, another example of um, nice scientific applications that you can do I think now, you know, now already, right, with experimental quantum processors. So again, uh, in NISC, um, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about continuing scientific applications and addressing interesting scientific questions. I'm, again, less optimistic about things like, you know, classical optimization because classical algorithms and classical computers are just very good and we do not have an exponential speed up. Okay, so that's um, what I wanted to say about NISC. Uh, so what is our long-term roadmap, right? Well, our long-term roadmap, as I mentioned, is to build a Folter and quantum computer. So what we need to do, well, uh, we think it's, you know, important to demonstrate first that you have a, a you know, a nice controllable quantum system with high fidelity. So uh, it's actually easier to enter the regime of doing a computation that um, you cannot reproduce classically than to do a logical qubit. So we want to do a logical qubit, but if you can do a well-defined computation that you cannot reproduce classically along the way, then I, you know, of course, do it. And it's, it's, I think it's a nice thing to do. And again, you're going to learn a lot about what applications you can try to do, because if you want to do an application, you want to do something that you cannot reproduce with a classical computer. So I think it's important to actually try and benchmark. But um, so this is just sort of a cheap entry point, if you want, in our ambitious roadmap. Uh, the next big milestone will be to demonstrate a logical qubit prototype. So this means we want to implement a scalable error correction in a way that as we increase the number of physical qubits, the logical error rate actually decreases, right? With, uh, with the surface code, which is perfectly scalable. Because once we do this, then, well, depending on, you know, how, uh, how much we are above threshold, uh, but, you know, um, if, if you are above threshold, not by a huge amount, actually, um, then you just need to basically scale. So if you scale to 1,000 roughly physical qubits for the sort of errors that we are aiming for and we think are realistic, then you will have a qubit that lives forever right uh you have like one logical qubit with infinite lifetime which is basically the equivalent of a transistor for a full term quantum computer and the nice thing about super superconducting qubits is that in principle is you know well i don't want to make it so easy because it's not but it's very hard to reduce errors and and, and reach the logical qubit prototype and, and even harder to reach the long lived logical qubit but um but if you do that, then you sort of there is the physics. So at this point, if you have a long-lived logical qubit, you are not so much worried about fundamental physics anymore. It's still a very hard engineering problem, but in principle, it's just the scaling technologies. 
So the next step will be, you know, a scalable module where like order of 10 logical qubits that then you can sort of solder together in some large fridge and build a full time quantum computer. We aim for delivering a full time quantum computer at around 2029. Okay, so um, pictures are nice, but you know we also want to do uh, numerics and analysis to see how much we need to lower the errors to really get the surface code to work, right? So um, we have um, uh, something that we call the Lambda component error model, which basically is the following. This is uh, the, the building block of the surface code uh, where you initialize qubits, um, you have an ancilla qubit that you're going to use to measure basically parities. And this goes then to a decoder. And if you measure parities fast enough and they were low enough, then your strat entropy, you remove errors, right? So the quantum circuits that you need to implement in, in a surface code look like this, repeated over and over and over many times. Uh, so if we understand the errors that we have in all these blocks, like the Hadamard, the control C, reset, measure, uh, idle time, very important, and idle time where we reset the ancilla because once we measure the ancilla, we have to make sure that it's in a well-known, in, in an honest state for the next operation. Anyway, so we assign errors to all the components in there in, in this cycle, and then we can run very efficient simulations with decoders to estimate um, how well we're doing in terms of error correction. So we published on, uh, we published uh, no long ago a paper where we actually implement, well, a 1D version of the surface code, which is just a repetition code. And that allows us to correct either bit flip or face flip because it's one dimensional surface code for the, in the sur two dimensional surface code. If you want one dimension will be bit flip and one dimension will be face flip, right? So anyway, in this repetition code, which is very related to the surface code, we were able to correct either bit flip or face flip, either of the two. And we see that indeed, as we increase the number of qubits, the logical error rate decreases exponentially, right? And the base of the exponential decrease is this parameter lambda. So uh, you want lambda to be larger than one. If lambda is larger than one, uh, then, um, sorry, if one over lambda is larger than one, then as you increase the distance of the code, the logical error rate um, decreases. Okay, so we were able to get a lambda of three, um, roughly for bit flip and face flip. Um, more important, we can check the component error model against the Sprayman. So those are these two things here. And we see that in this particular experiments, interestingly, what dominates is sort of the idle time because the measurement time in superconducting qubits and other qubits is actually quite long. And the coherence time is not that long, so you spend a lot of time just waiting. And that is a big contributor to 1 over lambda right now. Uh, and this is our projection just with the numbers that we publish. And we're not quite below threshold for the surface code, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, and you know, once we solve these, then again, it will scale. And superconducting qubits have a nice aspect ratio. So it's you know, a large scaling problem, but we think we can fit all the components, and it kind of will look like this. And if we build, I'm just rushing, this is my last slide. Um, if once we build a full term quantum computer, then we know for sure that we're gonna do efficient quantum chemistry and physics. I don't have time to get into the details of these, but we and other people, uh, we have a full team and Ryan Babu is working on algorithms. There has been a tremendous progress on uh, quantum algorithms for chemistry. So we're in pretty solid ground here and you know, all modern chemistry and physics is quantum, right? So we're very bullish about this kind of stuff and sort of to give you an idea of the latest numbers, which have improved by many orders of magnitude. Uh, we think we can simulate FEMOCO, which is an important molecule with around 10 to the 10 gates and 2 million qubits. So this will take a few hours on a full term quantum computer with superconducting qubits, but it will be doable. And anyway, this is like just to say there is huge progress on full term algorithms for chemistry, which is very important. And that was my last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we're a little bit out of time here. Um, do we will be able to pass the con uh, the contact if you have any questions on on, on the presentation uh, for later? We have the dean uh, waiting. Let's so actually get to uh, another appointment. So thank you so much, uh, Sergio, uh, for joining us uh, and taking time.
uh, to explain these experiments to us. Uh, so exciting times indeed. Thank you. And uh, you did mention that there are internships uh, available in your group, right, for uh, people who are in the programs. Indeed, yes. Uh, please go to you know our website, and uh, I think internships will start soon. So yes, uh, we encourage, please, the students to apply. Indeed. Great. Again, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and uh, to wrap up, uh, maybe I'll uh, turn it over to uh, first to Vanita to make a couple of closing comments uh, for the conference. Thank you, everyone, and uh, and then uh, we'll have uh, Dean Riley join us online. Actually, if we want to, uh, I'll uh, hand it over to the dean first, um, to, so she can make her comments, and then we can finish up afterwards because I think she has to go to another appointment. So, uh, Dean Riley. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vanita. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I hope the, I'm coming to you from my office right on campus and I need to, to run to another event right next door. It's been a very exciting week here at URI. And I hope the last few days have been full of interesting conversations for you, those of you who are online, those of you who are in person. I hope those of you who are in person enjoyed our campus at the University of Rhode Island, as well as our beautiful state. Uh, we were fortunate with some really great weather. It feels like summer out there today. Um, I noted in my comments at the opening of the conference that the, the tagline for the College of Arts and Sciences is putting knowledge into practice. And I hope that the conference was productive for each of you and that you found ideas and new knowledge that you can put into practice in your own institutions and places of work. As we all know, the development of a quantum workforce is significantly important for the United States, for our economy, our well-being, our national security, and I, I think many of the presentations spoke to, to this. Senator Reid noted in Monday, uh, on Monday in his comments that quantum is, he called it the next paradigm shifting idea and that we need universities in the United States working in this area. He also noted that the best path forward is coordination between universities, industry, and the government. This conference is, is a really excellent example of such coordination. And we at URI are actively partnering with government, corporate and government labs to develop a workforce training system that can be used as a national model. We welcome undergraduates, graduates, faculty and professionals from industry to join our Department of Physics in this endeavor. And I hope we see you again at a future quantum event at URI. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Dean Riley. I just want to say a few more remarks. Um, so uh, first, I want to uh, give a big hand to all our speakers and uh, panelists and poster presenters for uh, all their hard work and thought that went into making this a truly fantastic program. So thank you to everyone and the chairs as well. Uh, so we've had talks uh, from the National Quantum Initiative to uh, the quantum education initiatives uh, that are going on all over the country and around the world to how to build quantum computers, to how to program them. Uh, so I hope the last few days have given you a flavor of what this field of quantum computing and quantum information science is really all about and how broad it is and how uh, you know wide ranging the topics are. Uh, so. Uh, we at URI hope to uh, have a program uh, in this field now that uh, can uh, provide a nice balance point between research and education in this field. Uh, and uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, we hope this is going to be the, just the start of many uh, very interesting uh, discussions and uh, new programs uh, and uh, a lot of excitement along the way. Um, so. Uh, just as a reminder also, um, immediately, if you want to get into uh, research, I do have a postdoc position open. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that again. Um, and uh, so I'd just like to say thank you to um, everyone, including my fellow committee members for all the work they poured into uh, making this such a successful event, uh, including uh, Christopher Savoy, uh, Gaurav Khanna, um, and, uh, you know, including the planning for the conference, the IT, everything, um, uh, and especially to uh, our uh, physics department chair, Leonard Kahn, uh, 
for everything that he has done from the beginning to the end, uh, from science to logistics to meals to um, you know things I can't even remember anymore. So thank you so much, uh, and uh, as well as all the people who have worked behind the scenes, including uh, Amy Harrington uh, and Anuradha Weerakodi, um, and the work they've done with um, our department IT, uh, Steve Pellegrino, Katie and her team. James and his team, Matt and his team, and many others that I can't mention all, um, but it takes so many people to put something together, uh, like something like this together. So thank you to everyone. Um, and so uh, with that, um, thank you to all of you uh, who attended both in person and online. Um, it was really great to have everybody and all the interest. And I hope this is just the beginning of uh, a lot of more interesting things to come. So thank you. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs>